Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with Eddie Roberts of the jazz group The New Master Sounds. Eddie was running a club in Leeds called The Cooker, and from there, the beginning of his legacy in this band started. As we flash forward 15 years to now, they have a very large catalog of nine studio albums, two live albums, one remix album, and three compilation albums, along with being released in the UK, United States, and Japan, where they tour extensively. Their latest album, a very refreshing jazz listen, is 2018's Renewable Energy. You should get it. As a band and individuals, they have collaborated or jammed with an impressive array of musicians, DJs, and producers, and cats like Lou Donaldson. So please get to know Eddie, this band, and dig this interview, my friends. So Eddie, hey man, it's an honor to speak with you. Thank you for taking a minute out for Neon Jazz, man. I appreciate it. Sure thing. So let's jump right in here. As I mentioned before when we talked, your sound is unbelievably unique in not only the world of jazz, but music. I've, I've just totally fallen in love with it. And I want to know about renewable energy i know you guys are about 15 years into your john as a band but talk to me about this album and how you feel about it um yeah it's actually we're 19 years officially now <laughs> okay uh, and uh yeah it was um you know we you know we always try and make a, an album sort of every 18 months you know a couple of years just to just to keep material fresh, really. So we've just got new things to play. You know, we talk so much. And it's really how we get new material into the set. Um, this one, because we were touring so much during this kind of last couple of years, uh, it was hard to, to pin down times when we, we were all in the same country. We were all uh, could do it. So it kind of, it was a little sporadic, the way that this was recorded. Some of it was recorded down in New Orleans over a couple of days. And then, some of it was in Denver over another couple of days. Um, and it had been kind of like we'd been gathering material together. And, and it was different from how I've done it before. Usually, we, you know, we find a week and we go in and we kind of write and record the whole thing in one week. So it was definitely a, a bit more of a disjointed process. And I, I wasn't even quite sure what material I had when I actually sat down to to kind of mix it and, and put it all together. You know, and then we got the horn section recorded in California, the percussion recorded in uh, in the UK, and then we got the uh, uh, guest vocal recorded in in LA. So it was kind of a bit of a bit of a global album, I would say. You know, definitely a different process to what I've normally done. But uh, you know, the, the outcome I think was was something quite different to what we've done before. You know, just got there's some different sounds in there and different approaches and. A little bit more time taken on some other things. You know, it's, it's the, the story of how the band came together is quite cool. So I'd like to hear it. Words. Talk to me about how this band formed. We all found ourselves in Leeds, the, uh, uh, in the UK, in the north of England. Um, the only one who's actually from Leeds is Pete, the bass player. Um, the rest of us moved there for music school, different different music schools, but. Um, um, and then there was, uh, this is the late 80s, I moved there. It was a pretty cool uh, DJ kind of funk, soul, jazz scene going on there. Um, what they used to call acid jazz, which was a, a kind of anecdote to acid house that was going on in, in the north of England. Um, so there'd be a lot of DJs, you know, playing on the weekends and we'd go and hang out. They started making mixtapes for me. And that's how I got a lot of my musical knowledge was DJs making mixtapes. Um, and then we actually put the band together. So, we, you know, so we were playing these clubs. I was playing these clubs in different different um, lineups that I was putting together. Uh, I used to have an organ trio called Three Deuces. Um, and then uh, the, the, these guys, these friends of mine, got kind of got a new a new opportunity to to do a, to run the night in this venue and um they had two rooms and one room had like a live setup and live stage so uh i kind of tailor made the band to, to to play that every friday so it was kind of that was 99 1999 um so it's kind of how it started really it was we were tailor made for the club night and we did a lot of meters covers and um you know some kind of boogaloo stuff and some grand green things like that so that's kind of how it started, and then we actually went into um, a friend of ours' basement to um, just 
record a rehearsal so that we could like learn a few more tunes and uh and that was actually what came out that was our first single one no brown and the rest is history nice you know you you all are really kind of cut out for live music i know live music is kind of a part of what all bands have to do it's your carrying card to kind of get yourself out there but it seems like this is what you guys thrive on doing is being in front of an audience is that true yeah, and that's kind of where the title "Renewable Energy" came from. Um, it was it was because we've always felt that it, that that's what gives the music relevance is having an audience in front of you, and you create an energy on stage, and you get energy back from the audience, and and it kind of it and it renews itself, and it and it just gets bigger and bigger throughout the evening um, or throughout the lifetime of the band, really. Um, you know, a good point was that a, a good example was last night we were in DC. We just Came, came from New Orleans, Jazz Fest, completely exhausted on a Tuesday night. And, uh, and we were like, oh, wow. Okay, let's, you know, pull ourselves together, go do the show Tuesday night. And it was rocking. You know, the audience was giving us so much back that we had we had such a fun show. And, uh, you know, something that I wasn't particularly expecting on a Tuesday night, you know, especially being so tied up in New Orleans. But, um, you know, and that, that just kind of proves the point that, you know, it's like that energy process is a big thing that we believe in. There's different factions of music where, you know, there's there's groups of musicians that want people to really think, and then there's others where you just really escape into the music. It feels to me as though what you guys do as a collective is really give people a way of kind of leaving their lives for a while and just grooving, just really digging it. Is that kind of your goal when you perform live? Yeah, I'd say so. You know, it's not too introspective. You know, it's 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 you know, but at the same time, you know, it's not. It's definitely not pop music, and you know, so you are kind of asking people to to sort of engage in something that they're not necessarily used to. Something like an, an instrumental, you know, kind of improvised, you know, improvised solos, things like that. And um, you know, we've always been quite surprised how how much people do get that, but. I think you're right. Why it's it's a it's a, um, a kind of you know an escapism vibe, really, you know, and, and 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 again the energy builds throughout the night, and people get lost in it. We we draw them in, and and and, and they get lost in it, which is uh, which is great, you know. And and, and you know we def- we came from this again this kind of DJ background where it was all about keeping the dance floor going, and and uh, you know we used to have DJs who would play, then the band would come on. And, you, and our job was to keep the dance floor going, and uh, and if you, you kind of lost the dance floor, then you didn't get you didn't get booked again. So you know that was the kind of our, our kind of how we cut our teeth. Right on. And you've collaborated with a lot of cats. I mean, you, you, Lou Donaldson, Mr. Scruff, James Taylor, Grace Potter. There's a lot of people. What do you learn from these people that have been around for years and have all of this uh, clout behind them? I mean, it's just like every experience you have, you know, you take that with you and that, that's, that all, you know, becomes part of your sound and, and, and part of your life, really. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I definitely had, you know, most most recently, um, I felt like I gained a lot of experience from playing with uh, Sigurd uh, and George Porter from the Meters. And, uh, you know, just, the, just their, their, their joy of playing and their, their their approach, you know, where they're just, you know, it's it's all about enjoyment and not taking themselves too seriously. And, and, and you know, just a, just a, just a, just such a fresh energy still at still at that that you know mid seventies. You know, that's definitely kind of rubbed off on me. And and I say, okay, maybe I maybe I, I can do this for a, a long time to come. <laughs> <laughs> You know, you mentioned last night it was surprising on a Tuesday night, as exhausted as you were, as you have that feedback from the crowd. Can you remember another time you guys performed that just blew you away? You just you went into a show, you didn't expect what was going to happen, some kind of anecdotal story, so to speak, of a really good moment that you shared on the road. Uh, that's a tricky one. <laughs> it's an emergent, the one after thousands of shows. But um, I, think, I think it always is that that unexpected Sunday, Monday, Tuesday night, a town you've never been to before, a little, little small place, and you might, I, I have no idea, I don't even know what's going to happen tonight, whether there's, anyone's going to show up, and then 
you know, and then and it just explodes, and and uh, and those are some of the best moments. You know, obviously it's great playing big festival stage, things like that. But when you get those unexpected little little off nights that just absolutely rock, that's you kind of that really makes it worthwhile. You know, you just think, yeah, this is exactly why I started doing this. This is exactly why I continue to do this. So you're you're 19 years into this venture. You got the future ahead of you. Sounds like you're going full steam. You're selling well on the charts. What? How do you feel about your career, and how do you feel about the future of the band? I mean, we're definitely digging a little less right now. We had a couple of years ago. Um, we we hit it really hard. We did like about, about 120 shows just in the U.S. and and I think we all realized that we were getting a little old for that. <laughs> so yeah. it's kind of like we, we, we have the opportunity now to, to craft it however we want it. You know, uh, I think we're going to do like 60 shows this year. And I think that kind of suits, that fits really well into, into the band, you know, we are on them. So we, it also gives us time to do other things. You know, I've started a new band called Matador Soul Sounds with the drummer from Soul Life, Alan Evans, and uh, a couple of singers, Kim Dawson, Adrian, and Adrian De Leon. And, I, I've always, I've always needed a side project or, or well, you know, I don't like to think it, it's a side project, but I need, I need another outlet. I've always had a kind of a, a simultaneous band at the same time just to keep things fresh, really, because if you're just playing with the same guys and playing the same music you know, all the time, you know, it can get stale. So it's nice to get different influences, influences from different people. I'm the only one who's actually living in the U.S. Still, the rest of the guys are still live in Europe. So I do a lot of stuff. You know, I was in Jazz Fest. I did, I did ten, ten shows straight, I think, uh, and then they joined me for the last two, two shows. So I, I've definitely got a bit of a workaholic mentality, and and I just, I just, I like playing with a lot of people, and I like getting out there and like traveling. So in terms of the band, I mean, we're we're actually planning on recording a new album in December. Um, I actually just built a studio in Denver, and um, we're gonna we're gonna do that at the end of. Uh, end of December, we're going to go in there for two weeks, which will be the exact opposite of what this last album was, where it was very disjointed. We're actually all going to be living in this house, making an album for two weeks, and uh, I'm actually really excited to see what what comes out of that process because that's not something we've really had the opportunity to do for a long time. So you have had the benefit of performing so many times live for a lot of a lot of people, and the crowds love it. But I want to ask you. What jazz shows do you witness that really move you? <laughs> it's always hard to remember these things, especially at first thing in the morning. But uh, um, there's so much that I've seen, you know, and uh, I'm, I'm trying to kind of like just pick one or two out of it. Um, the first time I saw this kind of music live was I saw Big John, Big John Patton, the B3 player, when, when I was when I was 18 years old, and and. Uh, that was that was a moment where I was like, oh, I know, I see the kind of stuff I want to play. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But then, you know, more recently, yeah, I've, I've drawn a bit of blank really because oh, I, okay. I don't I don't operate very well first thing in the morning. I'm afraid. No, you're no, you're cool. You're cool. Let me ask you this. <laughs> Let me ask you this. Why do you love jazz? Um, I think jazz takes me out of my out of my uh, uh, daily life. You know, that's like in the way that people get lost in the mass sounds we take them on a journey that's what jazz does to me i mean that jazz you know listening to jazz is very much like reading it's not a passive thing i i, I get very engaged with 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 listening to jazz and, and uh it, um that is my kind of outlet so let me ask you this, this is my final question everyone has a version of who you are your family your friends your fans but you're in control of your life so tell me who do you think you are <laughs> well, that's a big one. Um, I always say I'm a traveling minstrel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just, uh, you know, I've definitely been giving a calling and, you know, and, I, and you know, I just try and try and stay, you know, true to that and uh, kind of out there on the road. Just do what I'm, what I've been put here to do, really. You know, it's, uh, I don't think it's all completely self-generated, you know, I don't, you know, it's like, I can't take all the all the accolades of, of the way that I play. Somehow I ended up playing like this, and given the opportunity that I'm given, and uh, and uh, I just try to stay true to that, do the best I can with it. Eddie, thank you for taking some time out to talk about the new album. Thank you for the music; it's beautiful, man. 
Thanks. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Thanks for listening and tuning in to yet another Neon Jazz interview, where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players in New York, Kansas City, and spots all over the world, giving fans all that jazz. And thanks to Eddie for his time and his cool. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino on the iTunes Store. Visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com. And for everything Neon Jazz, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends. Jazz.